Welcome to today's presentation, The Power to Heal, Integrative Medicine's Forte. I'd like to thank everyone who's part of the Virtual Evolution team for inviting me to this amazing conference of women uh, in medicine today. I am Dr. Anisha Gervais, a doctor of Oriental Medicine, an Ayurvedic practitioner, a yoga meditation instructor, and an author. I've been in practice a little over 20 years now, blending all of these different modalities of Eastern wisdom together. I've worked in various settings, mostly private practice for about 20 years, but I've also worked in, uh, in an integrative MD's clinic. I've worked in trauma centers, drug addiction centers, worked with community acupuncture, bringing it to different international communities, and my best accomplishment is, that I'm most proud of is working at a startup integrative medicine department at a hospital where I helped to establish the acupuncture department and launch one of the first Ayurveda programs in the country with great success. So here's an outline of what we'll be covering in today's session. We'll be looking at the rise of integrative medicine, global wellness trends, and specifically the popularity of acupuncture leading to a new paradigm of medicine. Let's start by first defining this term of integrative medicine. We see over the past few decades there's been an evolution of terminology. It started with alternative medicine back when I went to school in the late 1990s and I didn't really like this term because I don't think of it as a substitute for Western medicine. We then saw the evolution of the term complementary medicine, or CAM for short, for complementary and alternative medicine. And this was a little bit better nomenclature where we could see that these modalities could be used side by side with allopathy instead of an alternative. The best term and most accurate term that we have come up with so far is integrative medicine, or IM for short. And this really is looking at how these modalities can be truly integrated with Western medical care to enhance its effect, help deal with side effects, emphasizing the therapeutic relationships of multiple modalities. I'll be referring to IM for short through most of this presentation, although some of the literature or research I share with you might say CAM uh, or have another title for short. So if we look at the history in this country of the NIH, back in 1992 is when they first developed the Office of Alternative Medicine. In 1998, they changed their title to NCCAM, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, to reflect these changes in the nomenclature. And back in 2014 is when they renamed their department NCCIH, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. They spend roughly about $120 million a year on scientific research to help validate various integrative medicine modalities. Their mission is to define thorough, rigorous, through rigorous scientific investigation, the usefulness and safety of IM interventions, and their role in improving health and healthcare. So we've seen uh, this evolution in the nomenclature and also an evolution in how this has been represented through the NIH. If we try to define integrative medicine, I'd like to start first with a definition from the Osher Collaborative and this is taken straight from their website that says, I am reaffirms the importance of the relationship between practitioner and patient. It focuses on the whole person, is informed by evidence, and makes use of appropriate therapeutic approaches, healthcare professionals, and professions to achieve optimal health and healing. This is a beautiful definition and quite succinct. It also says IM applies rigorous scientific research methods to evaluate physiological and therapeutic mechanisms, efficacy, and use of approaches in society as they affect health, resiliency, and well-being. 
And we're seeing at, with that growing healthcare movement that there is more emphasis on resiliency and well-being, and patients are really starting to demand this as well. IM also educates practitioners, the public, and policy to appreciate and address the full range of physical, emotional, mental, social, spiritual, and environmental influences that affect health. So this is a lovely definition, and at the bottom of this slide, I've also incorporated some uh, of the definition from the NIH's website, which talks about bringing together conventional and complementary approaches in a very coordinated way, emphasizing a holistic, patient-focused approach to healthcare and wellness, and looking to well-coordinate care between different providers and institutions. So this is a great working definition of how integrative medicine has really evolved in this country and what it represents in our healthcare system. Now let's look at when we say I am or we say integrative modalities, what are we really including under this, this label? So this first picture here shows you how um, this is identifying some of the common IM practices with energy therapies, biologically based approaches, manipulative and body based therapies, mind body in interventions, and the old term here of alternative medical systems. If we look at this next diagram here, we can see that there's more descriptors here in looking at how each of these different categories of IM modalities, we also start to see overlap, where some mind-body therapies also overlap with energy therapies, or energy therapies overlap with biologically-based therapies. So this kind of shows us that each modality can bridge multiple categories here. This list shows you some of the individual modalities that we group under IM, starting from acupressure and acupuncture and aromatherapy, all the way to meditation, relaxation therapy, traditional Chinese medicine, yoga, nutrition, and even shamanic healers. So this is by no means a comprehensive list, but this is one of the best lists I could find that fit the most modalities underneath it. Now let's look at the popularity of IM. So we see if we look back to 2002, we had about 36% of adults in this country using integrative medicine modalities. The most popular was acupuncture, followed by chiropractic, Reiki, massage, and then yoga. We see in 2007 that this went up to about 38% of the population, according to this survey. If we specifically look at yoga and meditation, we see in 2012, we had about 9% of the US adult population doing yoga. By 2017, this went up to 14%. And we can see about 14% of the population also practicing meditation really showing how much this is growing in uh, the public consciousness and a form of healthcare. If we look at the popularity in the media, we see that the Dr. Oz show has really contributed to a lot of wellness information, popularity on the media. Uh, this was the first time in my practice I started getting phone calls of interested potential new clients who would mention or reference something they saw on the Dr. Oz show and why that was a reason they wanted to come in to see me. So we have about 74% of the American population that does desire a natural approach to healthcare. This is quite significant. We have one out of three Americans who say that they have used natural techniques and 84% of them said they would do so again. If we start to look now at some more details about the rise of integrative medicine, we can see one of the reasons is because there are so many benefits to these various IM modalities, ranging from better coping mechanisms, patients reporting more optimism and hope, 
a greater sense of well-being, this idea of their natural healing ability being restored, enhanced immunity, emotional balance, reduced stress and pain, more uh, energy, improved sleep patterns, the resolution of symptoms overall in so many different categories. We also see some of the benefits of IM is focusing on prevention, fewer visits to physicians, missing fewer work days, less dependence on medication and fewer side effects. So this is quite significant. If we had a pill that claimed to do all of these things, have all of these benefits, we would all be rushing out to buy this pill right away. So I think this is one of the most important things about Integrative Medicines Forte is really looking at the results and seeing that it really delivers. We even have the American Medical Association encouraging its members to start becoming better informed regarding holistic medicine, and this is really driven by consumer demand. We also have the CEO of Mayo Clinic saying that moving healthcare toward greater integration soon will be crucial for improving costs, quality, and access to care. I know as healthcare providers, we all want to see this. We all want to see our, our clientele have greater access to care. We want to consistently improve our quality. And of course, we want to run an efficient business and improve costs. One crucial thing I want to point out is that the majority of people don't necessarily share with their doctors that they are using some type of integrative modality. And also doctors aren't necessarily asking their questions for this information either. So I think it's really important that we encourage all clients to disclose with their primary care physicians, with their whole um, medical team, what care they are seeking and what results they are getting. As an acupuncturist, I'm always telling my clients to make sure that their MDs know that they are under my care. As we continue to see the rise of integrative medicine, if we start to look at IM in medical schools, back in 2009, almost 33% of medical schools were offering some type of coursework in holistic medicine. In 2015, there was an analysis done of 130 med schools in the country, and about 50% of them were offering at least one course in some type of IM modality. The most frequent courses were traditional medicine, acupuncture, spirituality, and herbs, and we see that this is a trend that is continuing to increase. If we look at how hospitals have started to offer IM, back in 1998, we had about 8% of hospitals, according to one survey. In 2005, this jumped to 27% of hospitals offering some type of IM modality. In 2006, this one survey says that more than 25% of hospitals incorporated either massage, tai chi, yoga, relaxation training, or guided imagery. 39% of those hospitals offered acupuncture, according to this survey by the American Hospital Association. In 2011, we see that 42% of the hospitals in this survey offered a CAM modality. So to go up from 25% to 42% is quite significant and really shows that this is truly being integrated into our healthcare landscape. And this is really how change is gonna happen is when we see that patients are feeling comfortable that their doctor is endorsing these modalities, referring to them, and integrating them into their standard of care. This was one of the great opportunities I had working at my integrative medicine department is really seeing how far the respect and um, awareness of Eastern medicine had come. 
much further from when back when I was in school in training in the late 1990s when we really had no acupuncturists in hospitals to see that now we were at 42% of hospitals is really significant. If we also look at IM at prestigious centers, we see that there's many hospitals, medical centers, research centers, including Yale, Harvard, Duke, Stanford, John Hopkins, the Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, UCSF, etc., that are all working to incorporate a model where integrative medicine is part of their offering and part of their trying to meet consumer demand for interest in wellness. So we've seen some of these centers build spa-like facilities, offer lots of classes for the public um, in self-care or wellness, or even for the staff as well. If we look at the Osher Collaborative, which has seven centers all around the country, including Harvard, Northwestern, uh, University of California, University of Washington, and University of Miami, which I am a part of, we see that their reach has really expanded over the years to offer almost 60,000 individual care visits per year across their different centers and is really becoming a leader for the continued development and expansion of IM in our country. So what is the goal for all of this expansion? If we look at the WHO, the World Health Organization's report back in, 20, uh, back in 2009 to start with, they said worldwide only 10 to 30% of the global population really uses allopathy. And between 65 to 80% of the world's population relies on holistic medicine as their primary form of health care. So this is really quite significant. So they say as we continue to expand primary health care across the globe, that we're going to really see success when we start to apply scientific as well as traditional knowledge. And we extend this range of healthcare services to also incorporate traditional medicine. One of the strategic priorities that the WHO outlined was reaching 3 billion more people and helping to create this sustainable development goal that we are promoting healthy living across the globe and not just to people of privilege or certain rich countries, but looking at how we can establish UHC, universal health coverage. And they identified that one of the ways to reach this strategic sustainable goal was to incorporate IM modalities. They call them traditional and complementary medicine or TCM for short. But this is really important to see that as we continue to see IM expand, that the benefits are limitless if we can really apply this in a systematic way. The WHO in their 2019 report also concluded with that 88% of their 170 member states have acknowledged the use of IM and they are countries that have formally developed policies, laws, regulations, programs, and offices for IM and that this number is continuing to increase. So I think this is so significant to see how this medicine is evolving, how the global reach is spreading, and how so many more people can benefit from cost-effective, strategic, and well-developed integrative medicine modalities. So let's take a moment to look at the global wellness industry overall we see that consumers are seeking wellness. And this is really what has fueled a lot of the integrative medicine de demand. So this um, picture outlines the eight dimensions of wellness and looks at emotional wellness, financial wellness, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental wellness. And I think this 
is such a wonderful and thorough breakdown of how wellness expands into all of these areas and how consumers are really seeking this wellness in every area. So for us as true healthcare providers, as true healers, we want to make sure that we are really starting to offer awareness of wellness in all these areas and incorporating that into our standard of care as much as possible. In this diagram, and this is provided by the Global Wellness Institute, which is based in Miami and it has a wealth of resources and information on their website. In this lovely succinct diagram, they talk about the history of the wellness movement. So starting with Ayurveda, the oldest medical system on the planet, started 5,000 years ago. Traditional Chinese medicine is 3,000 years old. And we see that ancient Greek medicine, which is where allopathy has its roots, really evolved from Ayurvedic um, influence as well. We see the development of homeopathy in the late 1700s, chiropractic care in the late 1800s, and we see how this continues until we really have wellness starting to go mainstream from the 1980s to 1990s. We see back in 2008, Bhutan was the first country to create the Gross National Happiness Index and has also been reported as one of the world's happiest countries. But they really created criteria of how to measure happiness and how to measure wellness. And then the uh, United Nations created their World Happiness Report back in 2012. And then we see that this global wellness economy has continued to develop throughout the years. If we look at integrative medicine spending, this statistic is coming from 2012, uh, this research survey that was done saying that Americans are spending $30 billion out of pocket on IM approaches. This is back in 2012. And this was significant because it was 9% of all of the out-of-pocket spending by Americans on healthcare and 1% of the total healthcare spending. So this pie chart helps to break down where people are spending their, their money from physician visits to self-care purchases to vitamins, prescription drugs, conventional care, etc. If we start to look at uh, some more recent statistics for 2017, we see that the global wellness economy is a $4.2 trillion industry. So here, traditional and complementary medicine is about $360 billion of this spending. We see there's money that is spent on preventive and personalized medicine, nutrition and weight loss, the fitness and mind-body industry, wellness tourism, the spa industry, and also uh, personal care, beauty, anti-aging, taking the biggest piece of, of the pie. In 2018, if we look specifically at integrative medicine um, industry and we look at how the spending is broken down, we see that uh, close to half or a little bit less than half went towards botanicals. The next biggest category was mind, body, fitness, yoga. The third biggest category is acupuncture. And then the fourth category here is this magnetic intervention. So we can see that these trends of global spending just keep increasing year by year as the demand for wellness keeps increasing. Next, let's take a look at the popularity of acupuncture. And I single acupuncture out, not just because I'm an acupuncturist, but also because out of all of the IM modalities, this is the most popular, the most well-researched, uh, and the one that is spreading into hospital systems the fastest. So it's exciting to see how far acupuncture has come in more than the two decades I've been involved with this science from my training to practice. 
if we look at one of the reasons for acupuncture's popularity is the WHO endorsed acupuncture many years ago saying that it could treat 104 conditions and outlined them according to various categories. It's from pain management, uh, which is probably the number one reason people seek acupuncture care, to respiratory, digestive, gynecological, gynecological, neurological, musculoskeletal, pediatrics, cancer, endocrine and environmental care, emotional and preventive care. So we see that there's such a broad endorsement by the WHO that acupuncture can treat so many different modalities. So this is where acupuncture is different and stands apart from some of the other IM modalities is in terms of its scope because it really has the scope to help improve every area of one's life from someone's emotional well-being and their mood, reducing stress, improving energy, um, benefiting their sleep patterns, getting rid of pain, improving digestion, etc. So some of the other integrative modalities we won't see such a big scope in terms of how much um, they can cover. If we look at the history of acupuncture, uh, I love this cartoon to just throw in a little bit of humor today. We can see that acupuncture has existed from prehistoric times with these ancient cavemen throwing their spears at this giant um, mammoth beast. So, um, but it has been around a long time, dating back 3,000 years. Okay, so if we look at the power of acupuncture, I know I listed some of the different benefits according to the WHO, um, but we want to look at how the power of acupuncture is also really an effective tool to balance body, mind, and spirit. It awakens our natural healing intelligence and improves the body's ability to heal itself. It promotes well-being, more energy, focus, joy. It really is a holistic view designed to empower patients. It influences our mood and emotions. It can help release subconscious trauma, bring repressed emotions to the surface and it's a, an effective adjunct to psychotherapy as well. So I have seen the power of acupuncture in so many areas. I know that many people in our audience today are coming from the oncology background, and so I'll just share a little bit about what I've seen with acupuncture and oncology. Um, with the cancer clients that I've had the privilege of seeing over the past two decades, uh, one of the things I found most remarkable is not just acupuncture's inherent ability to boost immunity, but seeing clients that are going through chemotherapy and all the adverse effects of chemotherapy and how much acupuncture is really this life-saving support during that journey. So I've had many of my clients, when they go to receive chemo, they're talking to other fellow clients that might be there in that space, They've often come back to me and remarked, I seemed like the healthiest person in the room and everybody else wanted to know, what am I doing? How am I staying in such good spirits? Or how come I have so much more energy? Or why am I not experiencing all the side effects that my fellow friends are experiencing as well? So I've seen acupuncture's ability to not just support the physical body, help improve white blood cell count, for example, reduce the side effects of chemo, but I've also seen acupuncture just play a pivotal role in giving people a sense of hope and optimism, reducing their stress and anxiety, and really allowing themselves to kind of get in touch with the spiritual side of the journey. And I know that no matter what condition we might have, um, what symptom or what disorder, I think we're all starting to become much more aware of how the body influences the mind, the mind influences the body. But we're seeing that clients are also using acupuncture as this tool to help with their emotional resiliency, to help with their spiritual journey as they go through an experience like this. One of my favorite stories I'll share about a 
young client of mine who was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer at the age of 38 and was under my care for about a year. Um, we saw that evolve into stage four breast cancer and she went through a double um, mastectomy and it was an intense journey to see someone so young going through so much suffering and one of the things this client taught me and I will always think of her as one of my greatest teachers is the emotional and the spiritual journey was so much more important to her um, even though her physical body was starting to deteriorate and she taught me as much during her journey of battling cancer as she was also my teacher when she passed away and just showed me the grace of leaving the physical body and how she had made her spiritual peace with so many things in her in her life and through that journey and it was just such a privilege to be with her and so I think that whether it's acupuncture or some of these other IM modalities we want to offer our clients a way for them to find peace through their own healing journeys okay so as we talk about the popularity of acupuncture coming back to a few statistics here um, the first survey done back in 2007 showed that about 6% of Americans or 14 million Americans were using acupuncture as part of their health care regimen. And this had gone up from about 8 million Americans back in 2002. A statistic from 2013 says that there were about 42 million patient visits for acupuncture annually which I'm sure has only continued to increase. 51% uh, of physicians refer to acupuncturists more than any other IM provider, and they really come to understand its value and its efficacy. So I will share from my own experience of working in a hospital, working in an IM department, is I was really amazed and impressed with how many heads of uh, other departments and other physicians across the board from so many different specialties were, st were curious. They were um, starting to ask a lot more questions about acupuncture, how it worked, how it could help their clients, and really had an openness to allow clients to uh, take that step in using acupuncture for their own healing. So I think it's amazing to see that endorsement from MDs, from uh, other providers in the hospital, nurses and staff who really encourage clients. And I think that makes a big difference in helping clients take that first step when they are seeking IM care. The American Academy of Medical Acupuncture, I bring them up just to show how much acupuncture has evolved in this country and how popular it is becoming. So this organization helps to promote the integration of acupuncture into the Western healthcare model. And their members are MDs. Most of them are graduates from medical acupuncture training programs. And they currently have about 1,300 MDs who are part of their organization and who have gone through this training. And they continue to uh, grow and expand as we see more MDs wanting to study acupuncture. So I'm pleased to share that at University of Miami, I'm part of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. And I was on the team that helped to develop our 300-hour CME program for physicians to learn the art and science of acupuncture. And so in this program, part of it is online instruction and part of it is live clinical weekends where um, the students get to get that hands-on work of needling each other and becoming well-versed in acupuncture. So I am proud to be part of this program and proud in developing it because we really had the intention of creating MDs that were well aware of the spiritual aspects of this medicine, really understanding the body-mind connection, 
and wanting to use acupuncture in whatever respective field or specialty they're coming from to elevate their practice and to really help clients see that they could get better results from the integration than just using acupuncture alone or just using allopathy alone. So um, this is part of the Osher Collaborative and at University of Miami Center, um, this is one of our growing offerings and we're hoping more and more MDs across the country will start to get excited by this, want to add this into their practices, develop it, and become much more knowledgeable about exactly how to integrate acupuncture care into their specialty. So now let's start to look at this new paradigm of medicine. We've talked about the rise of integrative medicine, its popularity, some of the global wellness trends. We've focused on the popularity of acupuncture as the most pervasive form of integrative medicine and one of the fastest growing areas. And so this brings us to looking at where are we in our healthcare system right now and looking at the new paradigm of medicine that is really evolving. So I believe all of us are living at this really unique moment in time where our healthcare landscape has been influenced by the IM movement for the past two or three decades. We've seen now that it has gained a lot of momentum through the proliferation of so many different wellness programs, classes, services, centers. We see that there are patients, doctors, hospitals, medical schools, businesses, and even corporations that are starting to embrace IM. I think that this is a unique opportunity for us to really start to harness the strengths of both what the Western medical model, where we can embrace all the amazing technological developments and marvels of modern medicine to fight disease and pathogens, but also recognize where are some of the limitations of modern Western medicine, where are its shortfalls, and see how IM modalities that focus on holistic traditional care can really help to fill in the gap. So we see that patients are demanding the best of both worlds, and they really don't have to choose between IM uh, modalities for care and allopathic standard of care. So we see that patients now can really get the experience of having customized individual care, focusing on prevention, understanding the mind-body connection, and really getting to experience wellness on so many different levels. And it's up to us as healthcare providers to offer these opportunities and to increase and raise this awareness. I want to share one of my favorite quotes here that's taken from an ancient um, Chinese text called the Neijing, written in the 2nd century BCE. And it says, maintaining order rather than correcting disorder is the ultimate principle of wisdom. To cure disease after it has appeared is like digging a well when one already feels thirsty or forging weapons after the war has already begun. I love this quote because I think this wisdom is so important for us to hear in, in our modern day world. So most of us are only seeing a doctor when we get sick and when we have symptoms. And so it is like we are digging that well after we have already started to feel that thirst. And so this, this principle of maintaining order rather than correcting disorder is the ultimate principle of wisdom. I think we've seen, in, even in Western medicine, this uh, new emerging branch called lifestyle medicine or anti-aging medicine. And so there is a concept moving towards prevention but we still haven't really defined that concept. And this is where integrative medicine, especially Eastern modalities such as acupuncture and Ayurveda, the two oldest medical systems on the planet, have so much to offer. So I think it's important for us, even if we don't have all the answers, to educate our clients about different options of understanding the importance of sharing, 
um, all of the things a patient is doing in terms of their care with their physicians, and understanding how all of us as providers can start to work as a team. And this is really how we are going to reform the healthcare movement in this country and really help change the tide with the healthcare crisis we have been in. We have really created a model of sick care and not health care. And as wellness demands keep increasing, we see that the sickness model no longer is going to work and it no longer is sustainable. So if we really want to move to a true healthcare model, it's only going to come from embracing wellness. So I come back to this diagram I shared with you before about the eight dimensions of wellness and show that this is really where integrative medicine's forte is, is that it does have the power to heal when we bridge all of these different areas together. Our emotional health, our environmental health, our physical health, intellectual health, our social health, our financial health, making these wellness um, modalities applicable to all people, regardless of their socioeconomic status. And as healthcare providers, we need to really help figure out how to bridge this gap. How do we create this opportunity to embrace wellness on all these different levels in our standard of care? So your role is important. Every single one of you plays a really important role in the, in the advancement of this new paradigm of medicine. You serve as bridges between Eastern and Western medicine, between private practice and group care, or working in different hospital systems or universities. You are the ones that have the respect of your patients who trust you. They trust Western medicine, they're curious about Eastern medicine and other modalities, and they're gonna listen to whatever advice or recommendations you have to share. Your role is crucial because you see how I am can be incorporated into so many diverse fields, specialties, approaches, and how it can offer really superior results. So all of you hold the key to advancing integrative care in your fields and seeing the wellness movement continue to grow. I want to finish today's session with another really important philosophy of Eastern medicine that says there are three levels of medicine. And this is what true healing is about, is approaching all of these three levels. So the lowest level of medicine is treating the physical body, treating its unique symptoms and conditions and diseases. The next level of medicine is also treating the mind and seeing how mental symptoms, emotions, and imbalances occur and influence the physical body. And then the highest level of medicine is treating the spirit. So this is aligning an individual with their destiny. This is moving past physical and mental emotional symptoms. This is where we invite people to truly heal and find peace and happiness. So I know this is something that all of us want in our own lives, for our families, for the people we love, for our communities, and this is also what we want for our clients to achieve this true level of healing of integrating body, mind, and spirit and using the highest form of medicine to find this alignment. So I hope this talk has inspired all of you to use integrative medicine in your own life if you don't already do so, to research this, be curious about this, connect with IM providers in your own communities, and to explore how to continue to offer more to clients and allow them to have this true um, healing through integrative medicine. I want to thank you all for your time here today. You can find me at my personal website, anisha.guru. Um, connect with me via email or follow me on Instagram at Anisha Nirvani. And I wish each and every one of you has a healing journey that is inspired through integrative medicine. Thank you.